So welcome to our multifamily case study. My name is Devin Elder. My co-host is Abel Pacheco with Apartment Educators. We're going to dive into a case study here, but I'll turn it over to Abel to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the mission for these meetings. Yeah, everyone. So uh, try to be as quick as possible while we go through this multifamily meetup vision. Uh, we really want to provide education, uh, how uh, a, an area for us to network other partners, uh, other investors, other you know deal operator syndicators, or somebody in this you know commercial real estate side. You guys want a place to meet? This is this is one of those. We started in San Antonio locally with COVID. We're now uh, kind of pushed us to to make this uh, virtual session. So we hope you you know hope you uh, join us every two weeks. We're trying to do this uh, most of the time during lunch. Sometimes in the evenings. Uh, if you connect with apartmenteducators.com, you can kind of see our future events uh, also on the DJE page and also on the five talents page. So we're happy to, uh, to have you guys here uh, for the meetup. And um, uh, just to, to give us a heads up on our sponsors. Thank you very much, apartment educators. Uh, so apartment educators is our, is our really lead sponsor. Uh, they are an amazing opportunity or Avenue for other uh, real estate, commercial multifamily, uh, whether you're in, you're, whether you're investing, whether you want to be a general partner, whether you want to learn more as an active uh, or passive partner, Apartment Educators really does a fantastic job of just running through the educational part of A to Z, everything you need to know about doing your first syndication and you know how, how to how to build a network and an ecosystem uh, of other like-minded people all together, you know, in, in one, in one area. So it's, it's a really fantastic program. They're always accepting applications. So if you need uh, some assistance that, that, that is who to reach out to. So let's keep moving here. And if you have any questions on the bottom of the zoom, at least for this first section uh, for the case study, hit the Q and a button. It's the easiest way. Put in any questions uh, that you have throughout the, throughout the uh, case study and we'll definitely circle back up at the end to answer those questions. All right, let's go to the agenda. Uh, so then Devin, we'll, we'll do a, a brief introduction of ourselves here, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why multifamily for some of those of you that might be new to this. And then we're going to get into the meat of the presentation, which is our case study. We'll do some brief Q&A after that, and then we'll have networking to close it out. So a little bit about myself. My name is Devin Elder. I was born and raised in San Antonio. I worked for two of San Antonio's largest employers before becoming a real estate entrepreneur. And I wanted to become a real estate entrepreneur for the uh, freedom primarily. And then, uh, you know, the finance component of it as well. So at this point uh, in, my career, in my real estate career with my company, DJE, we've done over 200 investment transactions. Um, we've got, uh, I'm a principal in over 2000 doors of multifamily now with a valuation over $150 million. And we, we wanna keep doing it. Uh, the reason I'm here is because all of this started with networking, going to conferences, um, learning from other people. I mean, even if, even if people aren't necessarily further down the road than you, Everybody you meet knows something you don't, right? So I'm a big believer in always networking, always learning. I host a podcast and I, was, I just did one this morning with a gentleman out of Nashville. And there was a couple of things he said that I just thought, wow, that, that was new information to me. That's very interesting. I'm gonna explore that. So I'm always networking and meeting people. I want to invest passively in people's deals. I wanna be a key principal. I want people to invest in my deals and all that stuff happens with networking. All right. Thanks, Devin. An amazing individual. If you guys want to get closer to his world, you should absolutely do so. There's a recent podcast that I was just telling him that he is super inspiring on. But anyways, my name is Abel Pacheco. Uh, good, to, good to meet everyone. I'm the president and principal of Five Talents Commercial Real Estate. Uh, about me, I'm from Corpus Christi originally. I now live in San Antonio, so half of my life uh, near the beach and half of my life uh, near the Alamo. And uh, I've invested for 12 years in real estate. I went from eight single family properties to 800 doors, uh, invested in uh, in a matter of two years. And part of that is with education. Um, you know, I'm a passive investor in about half of that and an, and an active investor in the other half. 
And uh, like Devin, a lot of the reason that I had this big fast forward button in my career was education, mentorship, coaching. So I attribute a lot of that success, uh, even to Devin right now and just, you know, the, the inspiration, the motivation, the education side of it. And so I love to give back. I love to help other people. And then uh, I'm always looking for new investors, right? New investors on our project, new general partners, teams to work with potentially in the future. So this is the avenue. This is a great way to give value first. And then, you know, hopefully we can expand our network as we go through the process. Nice to meet everyone. Okay, so let's talk about uh, first why why multifamily. You'll see all of the all these details in the case study, but essentially we want to invest in a real secure asset, something that is not going anywhere. Uh, unlike you know some of the, the the investment vehicles in the stock market, you don't know where it's going to go up or down or sideways right now. It's kind of crazy, but it's a real asset. It's there. Uh, it creates cash flow. We create equity in the property as we force depreciation. Uh, multifamily also has an amazing passive uh, investment opportunity for those high W two, high net worth uh, earners that you know just want a different way to invest and not have to do a deal themselves, like through single family. And then you know some people really you know want to get active, want to get their hands hands dirty, and it creates an opportunity for us to uh, active investors to be able to raise capital, work with other people through syndication, uh, multifamily. And when we're talking about multifamily, 100 plus units, uh, every once in a while, one will squeak in that's a little under 100. But for the most part, we're looking for big assets that we can syndicate, raise capital with and create, uh, you know, a, an SEC regulated investment vehicle. Uh, provides amazing tax benefits. You're taking accelerated depreciation. Just, you know, 27 years, you squeeze it in the first few. That's a very safe asset. So that's why multifamily. And Devin, you know, let's, let's talk about the case study, man. Dig in. The reason why we're here is, is these benefits get, you know, really directly related into, you know, re real world example here, real world numbers. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, we're going to talk about legacy apartments today. This is an asset we just sold <clears throat> in, um, we sold it in July. Uh, yesterday, I actually sent out the final distribution to investors. So we sent out another um, 220000 I think it was, because we, we closed the deal, returned everybody's capital and most of the gains, and then we withheld a couple hundred thousand dollars just to get through final bills and so forth. So real glad to just send out a final um, payout to investors this week, including myself, right? I was, I was an investor in the deal as well as the sponsor. So I got paid um, as a sponsor and then I got paid as an investor as well. So it's good stuff. <clears throat> this is a property in San Antonio, Texas. This went to a, a, a buyer out of Dallas, Texas. It's 130 units. It's class C. It was built in 1974. We bought this in March of 2018 and we sold in August of 2020. Um, so that's kind of the high level. This is a photo of it here with the pool. You can see some of the new color scheme we did there with the blue trim and the orange doors. We've got a few more photos here, but we can, we'll go ahead and move on. That's just a high level overview on the project. Um, how did it perform? You know, at the end of the day, that's really what these things are about. Um, it's kind of two pronged, right? I mean, it's, you want to go in and create an environment for people to live their lives. I mean, children are growing up here, right? And families are carrying out their lives here. So it is rewarding to be able to go in and create a better living environment. That's, there's no question about it, right? But it's also got to be rewarding for those that are putting their capital at risk in these projects, right? So this was, this checked both those boxes, right? We were able to fix a lot of things, clean up a lot of things on this property, and we we're able to generate a great return for investors. So our total purchase was uh, almost 6.5 million. And, you know, I should really clarify, this is total capitalization. Our actual purchase price was uh, more than a million dollars less than that as far as contracted purchase price. But we had renovation dollars, we had uh, closing costs, we had a fee to us, to the sponsor on the front end, right? So some of those things were baked in there. So when you look at our purchase price for the property, plus our renovation dollars, plus any fees, that total capitalization was right there at basically 6.5 million. And we sold it for 9.2 million. Uh, it was sold in the middle of COVID too, which is which is a little harder than maybe uh, it would have been otherwise, but it got done. The annualized return is kind of my number one metric. Um, you know, if somebody tells me they can double my money, okay, that's great. Over what over what time frame? You know, if you're telling me you can double my money over 20 years, 
that's not very exciting, right? Um, so I like the annualized return number because it, uh, it takes into account the length of the hold period. So we're able to generate a 24% annualized return to investors. And we sent out distributions while we held it every quarter uh, between seven and 10%. We'll, we'll, we'll dive in a little more. And essentially what this means is the net return to investors are 55%. Somebody that invested $100,000 got their 100,000 back plus an additional 55,000 um, in 2.3 years. So this is a pr pretty quick turnaround as these things go. We generally talk about a five-year hold and that's what we initially went into with this project, but sometimes you sell sooner. Um, and when, I, you know, when I'm looking at selling before that five-year hold period, I'm looking at that average annualized return. You know, can we, can we beat that projection? And on this deal, we projected, uh, I think 18% annualized return and we beat it help handily. And so that, that made sense for, for us to sell it because we're beating that number. But in general, that's kind of the, the overview. You could see a pretty big gap on the, on the value we created. And of course, on the sales price, we had sales costs too, right? Broker commissions, title fees, um, all that kind of stuff. So uh, there are there are sales costs involved in any real estate transaction, but you can see a pretty big delta there between the 6.5 all in capitalization and a 9.2 sales price. We created some nice value in a very short period. So we'll talk about how we did that here next. Hey, be, uh, before you move real quick, Devin. Uh, sure. So 6.494 to make sure everyone really heard it. You, you, you said the acquisition cost, the broker's what? fee, the title, everything's included in that top number, 6.4, right? right? And then the other point is the annualized return, the 24%. You, you didn't promise that out the gate. You promised a lower number, but you hit a higher number, right? So, right. Um, you know, just making sure that everyone sees that because a lot of times you see an OM and you're like, oh, it's 18%. Oh, that's, that's great. Or you see a lower number and you go, well, that's kind of low, but it's really about how you perform and how you do the deal. And so that's kind of the way you always kind of project these for your, your team and yourself. Yeah, it's a balancing act. I mean, you want to you want to show a, a return projection, and it, I've got to stress, it's always a projection, right? I mean, this is investing, and this is not uh, a guaranteed payout, right? I mean, there's there's risks in investing, but we talk about projections, and you want as a sponsor, you want to project a number that's high enough to attract capital. You know, if you show a overall return of of six percent over the life of the project people might go, I don't know that that's attractive enough for me to fund that deal or invest in that deal. Um, you know, if you show an overall return projection of 15% annualized, I mean, that's pretty good. If people are gonna have a, a hard time finding a consistent vehicle that's delivering 15% annualized. Um, conversely, if you show a project with 40% annualized returns, a lot of investors are gonna say, what did, what did they miss? Or what, what are, this is way too high sounds too good to be true. What, what are we missing here? Or are they just trying to over promise just to get our capital and then they're going to under, under deliver. And that's, so as a sponsor, you want to show a projected number high enough to attract capital and leave yourself some room to overperform if possible. And then the last question before you move on, and thank you for that. That gives us good clarification, right? The last part is the net return to investors. So that's 55%. You mentioned you tell your investors five years they we're going to be in there for five years but we actually sold early you sold you know in two years so walk us through kind of that mindset and where as an investor i'm like no i was trying to double my money in five years but we sold early now i don't think any of your investors are complaining <laughs> you you guys crushed it but you know walk us through that before you move to the next point too that's a great point you know like a lot of sponsors, we typically look at a five-year hold period and we make sure that anybody that's wanting to invest understands that it's illiquid, right? If you invest in this deal, this is a cash flow play with tax advantages in a stabilized asset. And that's, that's, the, that's the product, basically. And if, if the investors are on board with that, great. Uh, but it's illiquid. So we want to make sure people are comfortable being in for a five-year hold period with that, with that particular, piece, uh, particular chunk of investable capital. So if you, look at a, if you look at a double your money in five years scenario, 100% return, you put in 100K, you get 200K in five years. Well, that's 20% per year, right? Which is fine. Um, and 20% is an outstanding return, right? Um, but 
the way I look at it is I'm looking at that annualized return. Cause if it went six years or it went three years, you might not, you're not going to land necessarily land it every time right at five years, like you're projecting. So I'm always looking at that annualized return because that takes into account every day that their dollar is gone out of their bank account. And in this company, what's it earning? And that, that to me is the number. So uh, we did, you know, return capital, geez, you know, less than halfway through our projected cycle, right? But rather than getting them to 100% return, we got them to a 55% return and got them all their capital back way earlier. Now they can go redeploy it or spend it or do what they want to do. So now they've got that liquidity event and go do whatever they want with it. So that's what I'm looking for is, is that average annualized return at or better than what we initially projected, even if we don't go the full five years uh, on the project? Very good. Thank you. Great question. So we'll move on and talk about um, the, the financials. This is really the structure of the deal. But I'll walk through it here with you. We, we uh, had a purchase price on the contract, $5.25 million. We had a capital improvement budget of nearly a million. And that was for all sorts of things. Uh, HVAC, a rebrand, new signage, paint, a lot of interior renovations. Um, there was a whole lot of, of you know, physical work we did on this property. And then we had closing costs and operating capital. Closing costs included a, an acquisition fee for the sponsor that we were paid out at close. It includes uh, typically a month of operating expenses. Uh, and then I think we kind of overdid that and we, we wanted to have a little more operating uh, capital in the account there. But if you look at that, our capital improvement budget plus closing costs and operating capital and the purchase price, those three line items, you're basically looking at $6.5 million. That's what it costs all in to buy this property. Uh, it was built in 1974 and it was 106 units when we bought it. We actually turned it into 130 units, which was um, a nice way to create some value. We converted the property back from 106 units to its original use as 100. It was built as 130 units. Somebody in years past converted it to 106 units by <laughs> by poking a spiral staircase through a ceiling. Uh, um, and we, we removed all that and converted back and added units. The occupancy when we bought it was 91%, which allowed us to get a Freddie small balance um, loan, which is a great loan product. We'll talk a little bit more about the loan details. Um, we did take occupancy down quite a bit because it was just kind of a, a tenant turnover that we had to do. But the way we structured the partnership was a 7% preferred return, meaning that investors got 7% of the cash flow or they got 7% of their capital invested as cash flow first before any sponsor payment, right? So think of it, you know, 7%, 7 uh, uh, preferred return as a cup that says 7% on it. All the cash flow that the property throws off after paying the mortgage and all the other bills, any excess cash flow goes first into that cup for investors. So if an investor invested $100,000 in this project, we were going to get them 7,000 a year first. That was the first stop for that capital. And then the, what the overflowed out of that 7% was split. So the first dollar that overflowed out of that cup, 30 cents went to the sponsor, 70 cents went to the investors, right? And this is a pretty typical setup. This is typically how we structure our deals with a seven pref and a 70, 30 split. You may see sponsors getting much more complex on this. Um, we've always opted to keep it simple. I mean, we could probably, uh, we could definitely make more money by making it more complex, but we have a lot of first time investors. And I personally, my personal philosophy is I want to be able to explain it to you in 15 seconds on a napkin, how this works. And if I can't do that, people's eyes glaze over. And, and um, so I like it too, just for our internal processes, just keep things pretty simple. We usually do a preferred return, Investors get paid first, and then everything after that is split 70-30. So that's how we structured that. So we can move on to the, uh, this was our initial pro forma on what a sample $100,000 was going to do. So you could see that we were looking at five years initially. Um, in green there, we're looking at a cash on cash return percentage. So we were looking at 7.56 the first year and then jumping up after that. What happened in reality was, a, I believe, a 7.5% uh, pref the first year. And then the second year, we took it up to 10%, so not quite that 12%. 
And then in that um, second, well, into the third year, we sold it. So if you look at the average annual return in gray on the right there, we said, hey, this, we're projecting this project to have an average annualized return of 18.73%. That's, that's what we were thinking initially going into this project. Uh, we ended up at 24%, so we we're real happy with that. Even though we didn't go the full cycle, there's always a trade-off, right, between time and money. So I could get you your, your two point, you know, you're doubling your money, but it would have taken almost three years longer to do it. We decided, hey, let's take some profit now. Uh, you're never going to go broke taking a profit. Let's go full cycle on a deal. Let's get everybody paid out. And, um, you know, again, my, my metric for that is average annualized return. And we were able to beat that average, average annualized return projection. So I'm happy and investors are happy. We'll talk a little bit about the, the loan on this project because it was stabilized, meaning that this property was 90% occupied. And, and uh, everybody in the industry calls it 90 for 90, right? Is it 90% occupied for the last 90 days? So this property was, even though it, it, it had a lot to, uh, a little bit, had a lot of work, it was kind of a rough property, but it was still 90% occupied, which means we could go right in and get this agency loan, this Freddie small balance loan, which coincidentally is the same. We, we actually use the same lender and the same loan product on a, on a deal we're doing right now, closing um, in the next couple of days. But the, it was a $4.2 million loan. 80% of the purchase price. It was a seven year fixed, meaning the interest rate did not change. It was a 30 year amortization, which is pretty standard and a 4.8 interest rate, which was pretty good. Uh, you know, we just closed, we're closing our current project at 3.5, which is madness, right? Uh, but this is 4.8 at the time we bought this was good. One of the things not on here was it was the exit cost. And you know, you guys that are aspiring sponsors, uh, be careful on your agency loans with your exit exit costs, right? Because I see, you know, I have an offer on a deal right now where they have a $3.2 million prepayment penalty. So their price is, you know, that would have been all your profit. The, the price reflects <laughs> that, right? Their yeah. asking price needs to pay off that extra 3.2 million, which it's just it's not gonna work, you know, it's it's not gonna pencil. So be careful if you're getting into deals, what the prepayment is. On this particular deal, we did what's called a step down. So this is called the 5544332211 step down, meaning that in the first two years, it was a 5% prepayment of the, of the uh, loan balance. And then in the second, in years three and four, it was 4% of the loan balance. So we ended up paying, um, let's see, what was, uh, what did we end up paying? Four. We ended up paying a 4% prepayment fee to get out of this deal, which is a uh, 104% times this $4.2 million loan, $168,000 fee to, to, to get out of the project, right? Which is a, a good deal of money, but it's also just kind of par for the course when you're, when you're dealing with, um, with these types of projects. So just be cognizant as you get into deals, how, exp what your, your exit costs are going to be. Um, the IO too, I'll mention was a three year IO on this deal, which is interest only, meaning that we never, we never paid any principal in this deal because we, we owned it less than three years and our loan at payoff was the same amount as the day we bought it, it's 4.2 million bucks. It, we did not pay off one penny of that loan. In fact, you know, we paid more because we, we paid that exit cost, right? Um, but that's, that's kind of par for the course. And the same, the deal we're going into right now is the same deals, three years of interest only, which is a, which is relatively common. At least. Uh, on that, on that point, Devin, I think that's, uh, one of the things as a single family investor for years, I had to wrap my head around for moments. So anybody that is thinking, well, how did you make money? Because the appreciation of the asset went up. Uh, Devin said he didn't pay off any, any of the equity, right? but you force the appreciation, the NOI went up, your income went up. And really when you think about it, take a step back, you're buying an income stream, a re an income stream of revenue, not, you know, who doesn't matter what the cost of the property was, it's how much income the property generated. And that's what you bought. And that income stream is what you appreciated. And that's what somebody paid more, $3 million more from you at this point, right? 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's why NOI doesn't have, doesn't incorporate payment, uh, a loan payment. Cause the loan payment is such a variable. The interest rate is such a variable. People just want to see what is the, what is the net income, net operating income of the property um, independent of any loan considerations. Yeah. Great, great question or great uh, clarification there. All right, so that's kind of the overview on the on the um, loan terms that we had. I was pretty happy with that loan product there. Um, even though 4.8 looks high, <laughs> it seems high. But we were just happy at the time to get sub five, you know. Um, now, you know, uh, our lender tried to, you know, change us up. They raised it five base points from three point, you know, five to 3.55. And I was angry about it last week. Uh, so that, you know, it just, you just do what you can when you're closing a deal, you get the best terms you can. And, and, and now where uh, prices are, are high and everything um, in terms of buying deals, you know, those low interest rates are really helping everybody um, continue to transact and do deals. Cause if we could have got this deal at a, at a 3.5 interest rate, it would have, would have been quite a different animal, but you get the loan product you can when you're closing deals. And you know, the lights are never all going to be green at the same time. You're always going to have headwinds. You're always going to have something helping you out. And that's a balancing act. So I think we can kind of move on here and talk about uh, the business plan for this property. I mean, there was a lot of work to be done here, but essentially it was came down to three things. And one was that this is uh, managed by and owned by a family, which is fine. But uh, we saw a number of things that just that we thought we could improve on. So we brought in a third party property management company. Another big one was uh, that the, the property paid all the utilities. This was uh, $200,000 a year expense. That was a big one. So we turned we turn the property from the property basically in all bills paid to the residents paying it. And it took us about a little over a year to do that. But that really, really helped. And it's funny, you know, usually you rent, you renovate a unit to try to get a rent premium. Like, hey, if the rent's 750, you're going to renovate it and try and rent it for 850, right? Get a hundred dollar rent premium. In this case, we really didn't do this on this product. We just said it rents for 750 unrenovated. Now we renovate it. We spent four grand renovating it. It's still 750 rent, but you're going to pay your, your water and your electric, which came out to, you know, effectively a rent premium, right? I mean, it all drops to the NOI, whether it's increased income or decreased expenses, it's all the same of the net operating income. So we effectively, I don't wanna say raise rents because we didn't raise rents, but the, the dollars dropping to NOI uh, improved the same as if we had raised rents. And that took almost 200K burden uh, expense off the property, which really helped. The third thing we did was it was 106 units when we bought it. Um, there was, I mean, my estimation, kind of a silly combination uh, or, or uh, that where they, they put spiral staircases in there, which as an owner, I just did not like. They look dangerous, man. Um, so we changed that back to its initial uh, state as 130 units. And we actually didn't even discover this until we toured it, uh, which was quite interesting. But uh, we toured it and it worked out. And we changed it back. So it's now 130 unit property. So those are the three kind of components of the value add. Again, we didn't really push rents because the market wouldn't allow us to really push rents. And it's a class C property and kind of a class C area. And um, we didn't have a lot of room to push rents, but we, we did convert it to the residents paying the utilities, which was a huge increase in, in that operating income. So we can move on here. Um, some, we'll just talk about some photos here on the left is, uh, the photo when we bought it on the right is, is, uh, after we added some, some minor improvements. I mean, we, we, um, you could see on the left there, those doors are a Brown and this kind of a faded red trim. So we went to a blue trim. We did a bright orange door for a little pop of color. And then we added those solar screens. You know, if you look on the left photo, you can see the blinds in those big square windows. On the right, you can't see the blinds. We put up those solar screens, which, I mean, I've said it for years, but the I think the biggest bang for your buck on renovating apartments is putting up solar screens and uh, it doesn't cost that much to do it. So we definitely did that. I think we might have some more photos here of uh, interior and 
and exterior, uh, interior. Yeah, so on the left here is kind of what it looked like when we got it. Um, you got white appliances, you've got, I don't know if you could see it that well, but kind of this old linoleum tile, um, not a lot of pop. And then on the right side, we resurfaced the countertops, we put down vinyl plank flooring, great uh, paint on the walls, some cabinet, uh, brush nickel cabinet poles, and some black appliances uh, to give it to give it a nice upgraded look there. Um, and uh, just a quick reminder, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, before we go to networking shortly, uh, we'll answer those questions as well. So I see a couple there. Thank you guys. Awesome. Another look interior, you could, you could see on the left, the before photos, kind of this dated vinyl or uh, linoleum flooring. And we, t we uh, replaced that with the vinyl plank, which, which looks a lot nicer. Uh, and we did some painting on the walls, which you can't really tell here, but uh, it did it did help. One of the bathrooms here, you could see on the right side, the after that we just resurfaced it, which is pretty common, uh, just gives it a nice fresh look. And then you could see on the floor that we put down that vinyl plank flooring. And uh, we also resurfaced the countertop. You know, if you look at the countertop there, it looks, uh, it's got kind of that dark color. And that's a pretty quick and easy resurfacing that you can do to just freshen up these units. Uh, this is a, an interior of a unit that was pretty beat up. <laughs> uh, you know, this is one, these units were in a variety of conditions when we bought it, but um, we did a lot of work in terms of, I mean, once you've seen one, you kind of seen it all in apartments, but at least B and C apartments, but it's vinyl plank flooring gray walls, you know, resurface countertops, black appliance. It's not, nothing too crazy. All right, so we'll get to Q&A and then we're going to jump into some networking. I, I see a few in the uh, chat box and you'll see a chat box, guys, in your or a, a Q&A box. So go ahead and start typing your questions in. I've got a question here um, from Jesse. Can anyone participate? Do you have to be an accredited investor? My financial advisor tried to warn me about the SEC code, which warns about risk of this type of investment. So there's three questions there. Uh, can anyone participate? Typically, you need to have a pre-existing relationship with the sponsor. Uh, do I have to be an accredited investor? Depends on the deal, but usually no, but you will have to have a, a pre-existing relationship with the sponsor. I'm not an attorney and I recommend you seek your own counsel, but most of these deals are what's called a 506B exemption from the SEC. We're not selling securities here. Uh, and the reason we're not selling securities is by virtue of the 506B exemption. The 506B exemption from the SEC states that we can have um, an unlimited number of investors, 35 non-accredited investors, and an unlimited number of accredited investors, provided that we have a pre-existing relationship with them, right? So that that's that's uh, an, an important component if it's a 506b offering Mo historically that's mostly what our firm has done is 506bs um so that's that's the answer to that question we've got a question here uh how are risks mitigated from alberto big question there for sure right but some risk mitigation you, you want to go into is buying it right getting a good, good base on the property being very well capitalized and having excess cushion of capital having a, a well-capitalized sponsor, that's a big one. I don't see a lot of people talking about that, but if your sponsor can't write a check for 50 or 100K to get the property through a hump or, or get through the next draw or something like that, you'd be in trouble. And honestly, I've seen that a lot as a sponsor in deals I'm invested in where sponsors coming back to investors for 50 or 100K and I'm going, man, if you're running these deals, you need to, be, you need to have some liquidity. So having a sponsor with liquidity is important in my eyes in terms of risk mitigation. Um, you know, we've talked for years about the resiliency of BNC multifamily, and we're seeing it now in COVID, right? This is definitely an essential thing where people are cutting a lot of other expenses, but they're, they are uh, hesitant to cut their, you know, their housing expense and, and lose their housing. So we've seen strong occupancy and collections throughout uh, this whole COVID debacle, which has kind of been proving our thesis of why we like to invest in multifamily, period. Uh, what a question, how did you source this deal and how much time from first contact to close did it take? This was interesting. This was through a broker. I was, was off-market deal. Uh, I called a buddy of mine in Austin, and I said, hey, I'm looking for 100 to 200 units in San Antonio. 
And then he sent me back that afternoon. He said, oh, I have, I have this one. And I went out there actually that day and I secret shopped it. Uh, meaning that I kind of parked around the corner and took my ring and my watch off and walked in there and, and asked to be shown a unit. And then we put it under contract, um, I think within a week of that. And then, uh, so it's probably a week from, you know, seeing it to, to having a contract because it had already, it had fallen out, out of contract. In fact, a lot of people had seen this deal and passed on this deal. I talked to some other sponsors like, yeah, I saw that deal. I didn't like it, which is fine. Right. Um, so once we got it under contract, which is about a week after seeing it there, it's a, it was a standard closing cycle. And I don't remember exactly on this deal, but usually what you see in multifamily is a 30 day due diligence period and a 45 days to close after that. So a 75 day total cycle. Now you might see a 21 day due diligence period, maybe a little bit shorter, but your kind of default standard is 30 day due diligence period, 45 after that to close. And that's what we did here. Um, We've got a question from Paul. You mentioned the property paid out investors using a step down method. That was actually, the step down was actually on the debt. So the bank had a step down exit cost. So it was 5% of the loan was my fee to get out of the loan. The first second, first and second year. Then in years three and four, it went down to 4% fee. So that's what I meant by the step down. Uh, the waterfall is different and the, the we don't really have a, a waterfall here, just a 7% to investors and everything after that was split 70, 30. A uh, question from Tom, can you speak about the depreciation on this property? We did a cost segregation study and we, um, I'd have to go back and look at the K1s, but we, we gave a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of paper losses to investors the first year and some the second year. Um, question from Omar, do you think the COVID situation decreased the selling price? You know, we got this, particular deal under contract before COVID. And these, these buyers, I don't know if any of the buyers or investors are probably on this call, um, but they extended several times, but they eventually got it done at our contracted price through COVID. So I kind of tip my hat to those guys on getting it done. You know, we contracted 9.2 and, and we sold at that uh, and all the way through COVID. And it took several extensions and it was kind of a long drawn out process, but they got it done. So. Um, we've got a question from Alberto. How do you, how do you guys see the market demand in San Antonio? Um, I, I'll take market demand as renter demand. I'm not sure, um, on that, but San Antonio has always been kind of a slow and steady rent growth, but there's a lot of people moving here. Right. Um, and so we, we tend to see pretty strong occupancy numbers in terms of demand market, you know, renter demand, I think is, is good in San Antonio. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if that I'm answering your question there. Maybe Abel will fill that in. What was your acquisition fee and disposition fee? We had a disposition fee of 1% and I believe our acquisition fee was 2% on the front end. So 2% of purchase price on the front end and then disposition fees was 1% of sales price. And this is the only deal I've done a disposition fee on. I usually don't build them in anymore. Uh, great questions. Um, I think we got them all answered. Yeah, I think, yeah, great questions. I know we got some networking. Um, there's a couple more. We want we wanted to try to get to networking, but we do have uh, one or two other uh, questions. Maybe we'll answer these last two and then move right over because I know we have a link. And uh, if uh, Ruben, if you want to start sharing the link while we're answering this, we're actually going to go network on a, on our next uh, platform because we did a presentation here. So we're going to send this link via chat. Anybody that wants to stay. Uh, we're going to set up some really quick, like a virtual room, small groups. Uh, there's 36, 37 of us. So we'll sh start off in a few rooms. We'll do that a few minutes at a time. But uh, uh, let's see. These last two questions. Why do you think other investors pass on the deal before you got your hands on it? Uh, Devin, price? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was just it looked like a lot of work, right? I mean, it was, it was like a lot of Section 8 and it was all bills paid. And it was a lot of work but yeah. it made money for everybody. So that's all right. Um, question in your opinion, how would you rank Dallas, Austin and San Antonio? I don't know. I don't invest in Dallas or Austin. Um, they're very different markets. I only buy stuff in San Antonio. So you'd have to ask a sponsor that runs, I could tell you what I've heard, but that's not very, you know, that's anecdotal. Um, I, so I only have an opinion on San Antonio and that is, um, we're trying to buy more deals here. Right on. So everyone else, uh, 
future event, our next session uh, is September the 15th at 6.30. The entire time we'll be networking start to finish. You'll have uh, this, you know, a, a series of uh, these virtual rooms that we can all meet together just like we're going to do right now. So <clears throat> uh, make sure you add this, get this link. Um, you can follow us, apartmenteducators.com. You can follow us on 5TCRE. You can follow us on DJE. Uh, we're, we try to be pretty social about our next events. Uh, if you have any questions, just reach out to us here. And we'll, we hope to see you at, on September the 15th. Everyone else, you can feel free to start clicking the, uh, the chat link now. And uh, we'll see you there just shortly.